Good morning to both of you. It's a great pleasure to introduce the two very well world known public intellectuals, Rick, uh, Lois Ricard Gordon and Boaventura de Souza Santos, who gladly accepted to give an interview here at SESH in Coimbra. My first question that is going to both of you, but it's I will ask first Go Lois Gordon. It's really an honor to have you at SESH for this interview. And I think for us it's really important to know a little bit more about the research and political stances that have outlined your path. So, because you both share several points in common. So my first question is quite straightforward. Can you talk a bit about the key moments that have marked your options and challenges in both political and academic front? as a public intellectual? How do you define yourself as a public intellectual and what shaped your options? Well, first of all, thanks for, for initially <laughs> saying Ricardo, <laughs> <laughs> because it's funny, in my childhood, I, I was entirely Ricardo. I didn't become Lewis until much later in life when I had to sign lots of legal documents. But then uh, when, my, when, when I met my uh, wife, Jane, uh, she wanted to call me Lewis uh, because it turned out her paternal, no, yeah, grandfather's name was Lewis, and uh, so you know, love, love, Trump, you know, it it it, it prevails. Mm -hmm. So I became Lewis. But in terms of pivotal moments, uh, there are several things. Uh, the first thing is to think about what it is to be a child born in. I, I always mention to people I was born in a colony. Uh, but by the time I was a few months old, I was in an independent country. But these days we say post-colony or neo-colony, and that was Jamaica. Uh, my uh, uh, pivotal things for me are, are manifold. Uh, the first is from witnessing sites, uh, uh, witnessing brutality. Uh, the, uh, I distinctly remember 1968, when I was a child, when Walter Rodney was banned from returning to Jamaica and the, the protests that went across the island. I saw the burning buses, the fire, etc. And uh, it was striking to me because I, although all that was happening, it was also important to see how a community can be without fear. It was striking. The second thing uh, was uh, my father is an Afro-Chinese man. My paternal grandmother is Chinese. And my father uh, and his brothers uh, were homeless from the age of five. And my mother, uh, my mother's family went through all kinds of travails. And so these are people who learned, who grew up on the streets and learned. It, it, an extraordinary thing about my father and my mother is they were just they, they were people without fear. The only thing would ever really be distressing for my mother was connected to love. In other words, the harm of her children. The, uh, but the moving thing was there was a film about Paul Bogle, which was one of the people who fought against colonialism in Jamaica in the 19th century. And in the film, the group of the rebels were there, and they had to have extras. So as a child, I'm watching the television. And one of the scenes came up, and one of the extras was my father. <laughs> so with a cutlass. <laughs> you know, let's get him. And, I, and, and I, told, I was like, oh, that's my father. Right. However, um, immigration, right now, I completely, people don't understand the plight of, um, when people think about immigration, they don't also think about refugees. Uh, today, they're talking about it, but they're not, they're talking at them. They're not thinking from the perspective of what people go through struggling for freedom. Uh, it, it, when uh, um, I had to spend a period in the United States as an undocumented person, uh, we had to live with our lives in great peril. You never know who will knock at the door. There, uh, it meant my mother, uh, for many times, was basically prey to the system. And uh, during a period of amnesty, we went to New York to register for amnesty, and rows, block rows of people were there, and it was announced only 75 a day. You know, maybe a few thousand people. It was winter. My 
my mother and I looked at each other and we just stood there on the concrete in the cold until people just from exposure just started falling. And we just stood there and stood until finally uh, we were in the line in a way where we could go in and it's, you don't know what you could do until you're in certain situations. You know, if we would just, I mean, literally, we would lean on each other's head because if you fell, so somebody else would be in your place. Anyway, that's how we became legal in the United States. But legal in the United States when you're black is semi-legal. The, ex the experiences of, of the brutality, not only the naming, but you know, there'd be gangs of whites who attack you, etc. And, and my, um, in the midst of that, one of the things that always struck me was not only the story told by my father, but my uncles, who were Rastafari, Rastafari, were black Jews, but also black Jews are people connected to many communities. You know? And uh, my uncles had these books, you know. And if I go back to my childhood moment. The, um, uh, I, was, I was in an unusual situation of the contrast between my childhood Jamaica and being a child in the Bronx in New York. Childhood Jamaica, uh, uh, I was a child who began to speak very early, and so I was the baby on the lap of the women as they would talk. So I started speaking around three months, and so you could process things. That's why my memory goes back to that. But they would talk about events. And there's a way, a lot of people, when they think about political issues, they want to think of the great politicians, the activists, or the, but they don't realize the perceptiveness of, especially under a tree, communities of women with children. They think communities of women with children, the stereotype is they speak gossip. They speak politics. They speak about things that I didn't quite understand. And in the midst of that, seeing the beauty of the island, the, the the, I thought the world was Jamaica, and suddenly I'm in the Bronx with all kinds of things, sirens, brutality, etc. And there are these books, and my uncles had all these books by on black liberation. And of course, at first I'm trying to figure out what these issues are, you know. It was unusual to me until much later, um, when I was a musician, and I was in school, there was a, a teacher who gave me um, a copy of Malcolm X's autobiography. And there was another teacher who had insisted that we read the New York Times every day. But I didn't, I, I didn't have it, and he wanted to know why, and it's a simple answer. Mm -hmm. Couldn't afford it. So he said, he thought I was lying, so he said, well, I read it every day. If you come in an hour early to school, you could read my New York Times. And lo and behold, I was in an hour early, so surprised, and I read his New York Times. And after a while, we started to talk, and he looked at me and said, have you heard of Hegel? <laughs> I was 14 years old. And then we went to Marx, and this man, he was, he, it's, he, he was a, a teacher many people hated. They stereotyped, he was a gay man, and he was stereotyped. And he was just committed to the students. And he and I spent hours in these conversations on dialectics, history, etc. And then I would go to music. And then connected to that was jazz musicians. Jazz musicians, you go to their homes because I got to play with older jazz musicians, books everywhere. And they were all politically committed. So you put that together. And the fact that in New York City in the 70s, there was just constant race riots. When they say race riots, by the way, they fail to mention, there would be block loads of whites coming with hatred and weapons at us. And so it was clear to me very early on that there were, there were, some, there were several problems. One is that initial experience of love made it clear to me that I was in a world in which I understood what it was to be valued and to value others and respect them. Two, I saw a world that was conditioned by hatred and inequalities. Three, it was clear to me that freedom and liberation 
was more than simply a question of getting people out of the way so you can do whatever you want. There was something more. And, and that led immediately for, for me to be involved in varieties of political groups. In New York City, everything there from the anti-apartheid struggle to communities that would find way for immigrants to be able to go through school. We used to throw parties to pay tuition for, for because these people couldn't get financially. They were, you know, they were. We we found a way to get books. I would. We created seminars to prepare, and a lot of those people today are physicians, professors all over the place, because we worked together as a community. Uh, and um, and after that period, a crucial next thing that really struck me was when I was in New York City, and I became a high school teacher. Tell me, by the way, if I'm talking too long, because yeah. okay. The um, one day uh, I, when I was a substitute high school teacher, um, the principal called me called me to his uh, no, I'm sorry, the first year when I was a high school teacher, the principal called me to his office. And he said, I need to talk to you about the attendance rate of your students. And I said, well, you know, I try to do my best. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. An excellent New York City high school teacher has their students are 60%. Your students are 98%. And we found out that a lot of students weren't going to their classes because they were going to your class. There were students cutting classes to go to your class. So they offered me to the opportunity to build a program for students who didn't go to classes or students who uh, other teachers didn't want to teach. And I said, hmm, I'll do it if I could be really creative. Let's have fun with this and, and see. So, and what they told me was these students were so difficult that if 10% of them finish high school, will be a success. Anyway, our program had 85%. And we had to write studies of the program, and it struck me that the one thing you couldn't put in a study, because people say, how do you operationalize it, was why the real reason the program worked, which was that the program was a place in which these students entered a room in which they entered it as human beings. And it struck me, why is it that although we know we're human beings, we need to be treated like human beings? In other words, if you treat people and respect their humanity, they grow. If you don't, most people wither. And that was the question that I began to bring to everything, the philosophical work, the, the political work, etc. And so when I was a doctoral student in uh, New Haven, I got involved in not only the work I was doing intellectually, but I was involved with groups such as Brothers Getting Busy, which is an amazing group. We were a group of black men during the crack wars and the gang wars in New Haven. A group of us, to, now as an older man, I'm thinking, were we out of our mind? We, we would go into the parks where they'd get guys with guns and everything, and we'd walk up to them and say, Look, the kids can't use the park, and we negotiate with them <laughs> and set up ways, and, and we turn the parks into political rallies and plays and stuff. And these guys, you know, we, we did wonderful things together. I worked with the Black Panthers, the the Communist Party there, the social the very social. They, a lot of these groups hated each other, by the way. But we found a way to work together for the wider community. And um, that's at the grammar for the understanding of how communities can work to transform things. And there's a lot from there that was brought to the global work. But those things were, were pivotal because those communities, many of them were immigrant communities from across the world, many languages, and we all worked together for the betterment of the community. And so subsequently, uh, when I became uh, an academic, and it wasn't my plan, by the way, I should add, to become an academic. I really went to graduate school because of the question. And the academy is so racist that I never expected to be a professor. 
I never expected things to be the way they were. I didn't even imagine myself as a researcher. I saw myself more as a teacher. But what happened was I so loved writing. In my entire childhood I wrote all the time that um, entering a profession where you expect 98% of what you write to be rejected paradoxically gave me freedom. If they're going to reject 98% of what you write, then you might as well just have fun writing whatever you want since if the 2% get through, it's cool. And to my surprise, it was the opposite. 98% was published, about 2% rejected, and I began to learn about a different world. Great, thank you. I think that lots of things that you just mentioned, because I, I, I spoke already quite often with Bovin too about this trajectory, that it also resounds with some of your experiences. But you are in New Haven at the same At Yale, at what time? I was like, yeah, 90 to 93. Okay, yeah. good. Well, so a couple of, a couple of years well, before. No, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating because I think there are many differences and convergences. So I think the encounter, the main encounter uh, in, uh, in uh, kind of a formative years of uh, Lewis is colonialism, while in my case is capitalism. I'm, uh, I'm from a very poor family from this city. I was uh, a working class family and um, I was the first uh, uh, to get a degree, a university degree. My father was a chef in a restaurant here in Quimper, which still exists. In my, my mother would do clothing for the people, for the other neighbors, and, uh, and uh, she helped the community there. It was a very poor, a, a strip, 800 meters away from here. So I was here. And um, for my mother particularly, I mean, it was very important that I had succeeded because I, I was the only child, and the only child of the family that was going to go through the university. There was a, a richer part of the family, but they, my mother, in fact, was the domestic helper for that richer part. So it was a kind of a, of a situation in a very unequal family here in the city. Uh, and then I, I, I really was, uh, you know, particularly my mother, my father would, would work for 14 hours a day at the time, would leave very early on and would arrive at home at 11 p.m. Uh, well, very sweet father, wonderful person, but absent because of the work and my mother was always at home and my, my father would take me uh, out to the park here, in, which still exists only on, on Tuesdays, which was his uh, rest day. Other than that, Sundays and Saturdays, it was always at work. So it was a very difficult life for us. Uh, when I was 12, I applied to a grant to the Gulbenkian Foundation at the time. So I was uh, uh, 12, I was starting the, the high school at that time, uh, and I got a, a grant for poor children going through high school. And I cannot forget that the amount was uh, 1,200 1, escudos, the old currency in Portugal. With help, when that time would help my family. So from the 12 years old on, I was helping my mother and my father. Besides, uh, we have a system here of tutoring. Uh, you know, that students that don't do very well in class, they have, you know, particular uh, personal traders, particular people that tutor them on mathematics, on, on, on Portuguese, usually are the two difficult topics. Well, from the 14 years old on, I was a tutor. So the younger students, sometimes just uh, one year behind me or something, uh, they would come to my place and uh, to my house and I would give these lessons, I would tutor them for, for an hour and they would pay me for one hour. Uh, it was not much, but it helped. So I think that then I, I moved to the law school because for my family there were only two ways for a, young, a, a working class kid to succeed in life, is go to one of the professional schools. Uh, law or medicine. Uh, besides, uh, there was fascism here in Portugal, there was dictatorship, and um, therefore there were no social studies here. Uh, even economics, there was no economics here in Coimbra, and sociology was considered socialism, so it was really forbidden, as Franco has, had done in, in Spain. So I came to the law school, and, um, and uh, 
When I started, I, I, there was a, a double scandal at law school. I was the first working class kid at law school here, just 200 meters from here. They had never had one before. The second scandal is, is that I was the best student in class. And they were really surprised. How come? It's scary because usual law school goes, you know, the children of professors go to school. It's a family in breathing. So they, they were really surprised. So when they discovered that my father was the chef of their favorite restaurant, called Restaurant Nicola, that still exists, they would uh, have their meals at the restaurant and then they would go up to the kitchen. They would ask the owner, we'd like to go to the kitchen. What do you want to go to the kitchen for? I would like to talk to chef. So they would come to my father and they would ask the most uh, stupid question that, that, uh, that you can imagine. Is he really your son? Because he's our best student, but you know, I know you are a good chef, you are a good chef, of course, yeah. but, you know, he's training and so on. And my father, a little bit humiliated and at the same time being praised by his son, is really considered uh, very well, he's very well esteemed by law school, so yes, he's my son, he's, he's our son, and so on. So that was the, their surprise, and then, so I stayed uh, at, at school, and then uh, there was the, the period here that you were a, a good student, of, and I was one of the best students, there were two. Uh, and they also met, oh, sorry for coming, no. but it's very interesting because Boaventura met a lot of freedom fighters which were his that's colleagues, right. yeah, that's right. then yeah. ran away. They, they were in my class, that's why I start building my anti-colonial thing, because colonialism was, off, was on, right, uh, at that time. And some of the students were kids that were coming from the colonies to a, a you know, degrees here, because the Portuguese colonialism against the Spanish colonialism didn't create until much later, until the end almost of the colonialism, they didn't create universities in the colonies. Uh, you know, Mozambique is much later, 1961, and Angola is around a little bit later. So they would have to come to Coimbra, like the Brazilians, all, all the elites also came to Brazil for centuries, right? So they, they, they were my colleagues and we discussed a lot and we became friends. Uh, by the third year, uh, the, the, the law school year was five years, of course, uh, so, by the third year, some of them disappeared, and nobody knew. Uh, we came to know later on that they had joined in the, in the struggle. Oscar Montaigne was a very dear friend, he's still today a very dear friend of mine, he was Minister of Samora Michel in Mozambique, went to Belgium, from Belgium to Algeria. At that time, all of the people that were involved in the struggle, anti-colonial struggle, they used to go to Algeria. Uh, initially, it has been Morocco, before the independence of Algeria, of Algeria, then it was to Asia. And so they, they stayed there, and all the headquarters were there, the newspapers, and they would join forces with the anti fascist uh, forces in Portugal because there was a radio Argel yeah, that was the free radio for the Portuguese at the time, and you would listen clandestinely the, the, the radio from there. So that was my. When I got finally, I got a grant from the. the the Ludwig Erhard, who was the Prime Minister of Germany, uh, a grant to go to Berlin, uh, to West Berlin. And it was my first trip outside Coimbra, really, was to go from Coimbra to Berlin. And my mother almost died. It was, uh, and I, I went by train. Uh, my mother was so afraid that, that something would happen to me, you know, what is, you're talking about 1963, 64. And my mother is really frightened. I, I remember that I had, you know, special uh, pockets here inside because my mother was <laughs> afraid that people would steal the money. And she would give me all kinds of cookies and so on. Everything got rotten in the trip uh, from Coimbra to Berlin because we had to go through Paris and from Paris to, 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 to Berlin. And uh, when I was there, it was really discovery. Uh, for me. I lived in, in West Berlin, in Neue Kantstrasse, and I went there to study philosophy. So I moved from, from law to philosophy of law. And I was even about to translate one of the philosophy books uh, that I really liked a lot. And, but the first book I, 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 I read in Germany was very pivotal for me. It was Der Mensch im Recht, Man in Law by Gustav Radoch. 
which was one of the theoreticians that had escaped Nazism and so on. So there was, a, you know, West Berlin was, you know, poised to become an American city in the core, in the, in the heart of, of Europe. And the show we know against the, the East Berlin, which was the communist side of Berlin. And, and there was a war at the time, right? And I was in Berlin when, uh, when Kennedy came to Berlin and said, Ich bin ein Berliner. Um, so I, my experience there was very, very important for me. It was my first real uh, experience was the fact that um, I could see freedom, freedom of expression, democracy. <laughs> because I came from dictatorship. We could discuss. I was in a Catholic in mine, in a student, in a Catholic uh, uh, um, residence. They were very progressive and we had meetings all the time. So, and then uh, we had the chance to go to cross the wall and go to the other side. Well, it was such an experience to go to another world, as a matter of fact. There was Walter Rubrich, who was at the time the Prime Minister. It was Stalinism, very bad stuck Stalinism. And uh, I went, and the first, the most important celebration for them was the May 1st. Of course, every foreign student would go from West Berlin to East Berlin to attend that celebration. And then I met uh, a girl there and she became my, my girlfriend. So from then on I used to go across the wall very often to go to the other side of, of Berlin and I would carry with me chocolates and stockings and cigarettes because there was really lack of all these products in East Berlin for her father, for her family and for so on. So it was really two worlds in one world. Every time that we crossed the checkpoint, the child, checkpoint Charlie uh, or Friedrich Strasse, uh, they would give us the complete works of Lenin. Uh, not Marx, not Trotsky, as you can imagine, but Lenin. So we built tables at our residence with that, because there were so <laughs> many books so many times that we built tables and we celebrate with it. That's why I didn't become, become Marxist uh, in Berlin, uh, because I could see it on you know, I, I was trying to develop a critical mind, but, you know, I don't want this. I'm on the other side of the world. This can't be what uh, Marxism is all about. So, and we had a very interesting discussion. Then, a very traumatic experience uh, to, for me in Berlin was that, uh, uh, the, since I was in Portugal, and there, as you know, there was lots of colonialism in Europe, right? Uh, from North Europe vis-a-vis -vis South Europe, we have been victimized by lots of colonial prejudices. I, I, I even wrote a piece that in 17th century and 18th century, the friars that would come from North Europe to South Europe to do the, 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 the reports about the, the, the monks here, they would say that the Portuguese, the Spaniards and the Italians were mischievous, sexually oriented, uh, indolent, uh, uh, not hygienic. Every adjective that we use to describe and stereotype the native people in Africa and in, 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 uh, in, uh, in America were used against us. So it was very interesting. When I arrived there, the first thing that one guy asked me was that if Portugal was in North Africa. <laughs> so no, it's not North Africa. But, you know, it was not a democracy and so on and so forth. So we had a meeting there on, on colonialism. And I remember as today that the title was Portugal, Portugal das Erpa des Colonialismus. And um, I gave the talk, and uh, and uh, on the on the behind on the, at the end of the room there were a couple of students with uh, uh, what a diapositive we call what these uh, pictures that we at the time uh, uh, could project on on the wall was the uh, we call diapositive I don't know if this but it's, it's, uh, it's like slides slides it was slides that's right there were slides I well, found that strange but nothing happened. And, and I was very critical of Portuguese colonialism, of course, and so on and so forth. And so at the end of the, of the, of the, 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 the session, the people behind came to me and said, we are from the SDS, the Socialist Student Bund. Uh, well, the SDS, from which Rudy Dutska and all the others started. And we came here because since you are Portuguese, we thought that you were coming to defend the, the Portuguese colonialism. So we have the pictures here yes, of the massacres of the colonialists in, in Angola and Mozambique, so we are ready for you. But now, would you like to join the organization? They said, no, I'm a foreigner, I don't know, I don't know, I can't do that. But it was my, 
my first encounter, right? And uh, I, 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 went, I came back to Coimbra and then I was, I was here for a couple of years. The situation was the end of the regime, was a little one, they were trying to ease it up, uh, so to say. But uh, of course there was no opening in the social sciences. And uh, in Berlin, after having studied, and I, I read you know, all Hegel in German at the time, and you can you see his library like this, the Surkamp edition that I still have, um, I, I really felt that uh, for the social sciences Portugal was closed and Germany was also not very, very good. But for us, Germany was philosophy at that time. And uh, so when I arrived at Yale, so I got a grant uh, to go, I, I, got a, I was accepted at Harvard, at Philadelphia and, uh, and Yale, and uh, Yale gave me a grant. Besides, my wife was already a student there. She was a student of Errol Bloom and did a PhD with Errol Bloom. Uh, and uh, you are meeting her tomorrow, probably in the, in the talk, because yesterday she wanted to meet you, but then there were so many people and she uh, slipped away. Uh, so, and um, uh, having said that, when I arrived in Berlin, it was lots of problems. In fact, my, uh, I came to know much later that the guys that were really sensitive to a foreign guy that arrives there, that had some difficulties with the English, because my second language was uh, French and then German. So I think English for me was a little bit uh, a challenge, right? And they went to Jewish professors that were for the first time at uh, the Goldsteins. And for the first time, they were the first generation of Jewish professors. They told me much later, I didn't know that, but they were so nice, they advised me, they would call me to the office and so on. I was in a study on law and development, so it was social science plus the law school. So that was a, a, a specific program. And Yale was, so I arrived in 1970 and left in 1973. So you know it's the anti-war movement mm -hmm. and the Black Panther movement. is the first time that there is a strike at Yale. And, uh, and it is at Yale that I became a Marxist. Mm -hmm. So because we had a reading group, a capital reading group, that would meet in the underground of the International Library, in the library upstairs, and then there's the International Library in the cellar at, at Yale, a law school, the building down there. And um, we would read uh, with uh, uh, some careers coming from uh, every country that were there for the PhD, and we would read Marx, and we start there. Besides, there was a, a marvelous Irish professor on Marx, that we had a course on Marx, O'Brien, uh, that was very good, and the first Hegelian, the last Hegelian, Findlay, at Yale, because from then on was just an American philosophy, and Findlay was the last one. <laughs> so it was a very, a very rich, for me a very rich period. Uh, uh, I remember yeah. Findlay, by the way. What? He taught a course, Philosophy of Marxism. Really? Yeah. At the time, it was, the si it was the science of logic. Yeah, no, it's just striking as you speak. <laughs> it's, it's funny, every time we think you and I meet up, we, we find yeah. out these odd similarities and connections. <laughs> because, um, you know, um, the, one of the observations that, um, that, that, that um, I, I, um, I discussed a lot with Jane, my wife Jane, is um, it's always struck me this strange thing about ruling classes, which is that um, many of them are not interested in education but they want to be certified as educated, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Because they, they already have their wealth, right? So, and you know these scandals in the U.S. Well, we've yeah. always known this. Yeah. And it struck me, uh, why do they want to appear? And part of it is they're invested in it. They want to believe there's an inner essence that will reproduce their wealth that's yeah. there. And it struck me, I saw that when I um, was at Yale. And it's funny because, yeah, it was interesting we ended up there because, yeah, the options I had were, were Harvard and there, and Harvard was very shocked when I said I wasn't coming. They, 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 to the point where when I was there, I had a bill that to being a student at Harvard, I just paid, but I'm not a Harvard <laughs> student, because they couldn't believe that a black kid from Rochester yeah. turned it down, right? But the thing that's striking, the reason I brought up this is, we're in a strange period right now. Because at least when we went to those elite institutions, there was a belief in a win-win. You should, you should have a, a working class support, because I mean, class level, we're the same story, right? Come in, 
because it was a win-win for elite institutions. If this person makes big, the institution looks good. If the person doesn't, because of the networks, the person is still well off, so the institution looks good. That sensibility has been abandoned. Absolutely. Especially in the States. The, the, the uh, creativity, for instance, I mean, I know for a fact that a person like me would not have access to those institutions today. Uh, when I had applied, I was a very unusual applicant. Because when I applied, I sent a, the, the proposal for the program that I had created, the one I talked about. But I also sent two, th th two unusual documents. One, was, one was, was a set of essays in Aristotle and Kant. But the, third, but the next document was unusual. It was a short story. And it's a story about a guy who had a date with a woman who took him to a cannibal restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> that raises some ethical issues, doesn't it? <laughs> so, you see, I, I think that you are right that at the time, well, uh, I, I share your reading, particularly because, well, I was at a very particular time later, of course, uh, uh, earlier, but it was the first time that, in fact, uh, uh, Yale was opening up. Yeah. And the Board of Trustees reflect that. But it was a very short period. Because when I left uh, late 1973, they changed the Board of Trustees. And some of my professors lost their jobs, in fact. Some of them, they were very exciting people that were, you know, tenure track position, younger people that related a lot with all of them were kicked out. Because before, we have been in the struggles. We have been, I have been in the green with, with Black Panthers, Bobby Seale visiting us and discussing with them. Then there was the war on poverty. So there was very large involvement of Yale with war on poverty. I remember going to Chicago to visit how the people in the slums in Chicago were trying to do advocacy, progressive legal advocacy to the, to the, the, the poor people, you know, war on, the poor, uh, on poverty. So it was a very, but in, in fact what changed BRTL, uh, besides becoming a Marxist, uh, was uh, was that at the end of well by the middle of, of the program in this development kind of studies you could choose a country to do your empirical work because uh, it was the math it was sociology so it was social de development and sociology was a joint program so and I chose Brazil uh, because both my grandparents have been workers in Brazil and very poor workers actually never became rich. So, and they told me so many stories about Brazil that I wanted to go back. So I went there. And what I wanted to, to do a study, because I, I was really made sensitive by the things that we are witnessing in the United States. I mean, going to the periphery of New Haven, which was for the first time for the people from, from, from Yale to go to the suburbs where the black people lived and so on. All this was new for me and some of our professors to us. And that was really fascinating. So I decided that I should go to analyze the, the situation of marginalized uh, the slums, the favelas in Rio. And I went to, to Brazil. And I think that what I call today Ipsmodos of the South started then. Because I live, I decided to live for a couple of months, for four months in Chutzum in the community. I did my preparatory work and then I lived in the community. And I lived intensely. I didn't even do participant observation. It was was uh, participation, you know, participation. And that's why lots of my data could not be used. Uh, for instance, if I would participate in the Umbanda rituals, very often I would, uh, the sand would come down on me. Because after seven hours of heavy smoking and drums, you, you are out of your mind. And, uh, and you lose conflict of diaries and Or things. higher consciousness. Your, yeah, higher consciousness. Your, 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 your mind gets it's free. Your mind gets it's, it doesn't care about diaries. It's, free it's care about mind. something. So I lost this for my field research. I, I lost for many other reasons, because I changed the field while I was there, and I was not supposed to change the field according to the rules of sociology and anthropology that we were taught. Because for instance, people would give me advice in a dispute among the neighbors, I would give my advice. I wasn't supposed to give advice. So I think that that experience was very, very transformative for me because that's where 
I saw that how people are wise are the people. I even spent hours with the shoe repair guy. That would say a few men stayed in favela during the day because they were workers outside and women would say. So I would, would discuss a lot with women because they were the ones that are in favela. And a few men in the boutique, in the bar, and the shoemaker, and the sastre, and the, the, the dressmaker, and so on. They were men. So we discuss, you know, it's, it, it, besides your experience about politics, it was not gossiping. We were discussing politics. They told me before they wouldn't tell me anything about, you know, the politics of the favela, because you, you were under dictatorship then, you know, the military dictatorship. Well, at the time, during research in Brazil, uh, sociological research, anthropological, was an American thing, a North American thing. And people were very suspicious of that. Because they think these people are going to inform the CIA. Yeah. And they did it. But sometimes it was also unjust. That's why we like both of us, like complexity, because there were some of our colleagues that did very interesting work. I remember uh, Tony Leeds, he's an anthropologist from Texas. He did a very beautiful work. He was very positional uh, because he was raised up also the anti war movement and so on. But he was North American, so people would never tell him any critical information about Fabel. When I arrived, I had a, a crisis of identity because they would ask me, but you are Portuguese, so you cannot be a sociologist because Portuguese people can be able to sell things. What is your business? What do you want? I said, but I don't want, I would like to do a study, but, but no, it doesn't fit. Then we started again outside the canon, we start discussing politics. And they were very curious about the Portuguese situation. What do you think of Portugal? It's wow, it's terrible dictatorships, military, uh, a civil dictatorship with this, 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 and this, and this. This is probably unbearable. When I, when I start saying this, I was eye-opening for them because they could see that they could trust me because I was against dictatorship. It so happened that all these people in the residence associations were clandestine leaders of the Communist Party that were working in favelas, shoemakers, and, but they would never say this to the American researcher, never. So what we had, and that's my final point about that, because the final is the revolution in 74. What they would do is that they would train some young, so I remember when we discussed the traditional authorities, that you say that the colonialists very often thought that the tra traditional authorities were not the traditional, the real ones, because the real ones would delegate uh, their power, you are. You are going to be, for the colonialists, you are the traditional authority. We saw that in our research in Mozambique very often. So, uh, uh, these people, in fact, uh, I don't know, I was telling about the, the traditional authorities because of the... The, the, the associated people of the association being clandestine members of the community. That's right. But they never yeah, that's right. They, they, yeah, but, but, the, but the problem is that they have to train these uh, middle-aged guys as uh, informers for the, the, the researchers. And they were, they were intense sessions of, of training. How you if they ask you this, how do you respond? If you ask this, how do you respond? So they, the guys would get false information all the time and would write dissertations <laughs> based on that false information. Fake, I have so many fake arguments. News, fake news. I have so many okay. arguments with, with eminent anthropologists on this issue because they're just convinced they don't know. But the, I know a lot of us know the other side yeah. of how much false information they disseminate. And how people. long it takes to get So it. It just to conclude, it was really very formative for me because then when, when they trust me, that's why the, the question of trusteeship became so important for me. And that's why I come as the validation of knowledge in struggle is not uh, just the validation in scientific terms, but in popular knowledge is trust. How can you trust? And you can trust if you join in the risks that people are taking. And uh, I joined with them and I was very satisfied at the end, but then was the other side of it, is that first I could not uh, uh, write about this because everything uh, could be dangerous for the community. I could not identify my community. I called it Pazargada, which was uh, the name, uh, a fictitious name by a, a, a poet. Manuel Bandeira has written a poem of Pazargada. Uh, 
idyllic place that I call it Pesaria that never described. Then when I arrived at Yale to write my, my dissertation, at almost two years uh, to write this dissertation, my professor, my, one of my supervisors, I can't remember, I, I, I will never forget his name, Leo Lipson, because the guy was an anti-communist, an active involved, the guy that was teaching uh, courses on anti-communism. And uh, he was in charge of reading, of one of the readers of my thesis. And there was a lot on Marx. And he said, no, it's not relevant. I mean, I do nothing against Marxism, but it's not relevant for your thesis. So you should not be able to include, the, the, you should not include Marxism. And uh, then they talked with the Goldsteins, and, and the people were discuss discussing whether I should include. And the agreement was that, well, oh, probably this is not very relevant to your son, so I have to shorten the chapter on Marxism. Then Ivan Ilyich in Cuernavaca uh, published my thesis, the whole thesis, for the first time outside university, uh, the, full, uh, uh, the full thesis with, with Marx. And that was very, very, for me it was very formative my study uh, because I could see how people living such an undignified life were so wise. They know so much about politics about the sense of life, about the meaning of life, about the way in which you should relate it to each other, about socialism, actually, some of them. So when I came back, then I was, uh, I was, uh, I was interviewed to, to go to, to, uh, to stay at the United States because I didn't want to come back to, to Portugal, and uh, I was accepted at NYU at uh, Buffalo to, to teach. It was one of my professors, Red Schwartz, uh, that uh, has been a professor and, and he was the, now the, the dean of the law school to teach sociology of law there. And then I came to, back to Portugal to see how things were going and all of a sudden I started, uh, some people didn't want me at law school because I was doing sociology and sociology was not supposed to be a legal part of the teaching. So they kicked me out of the law school to come to a new school of economics that was being created in Queen in 1973. I started teaching in October, just uh, you know, experimental, before entering the, the following year at, uh, at the NYU Buffalo. And all of a sudden, in, in April, there is the revolution, 94 uh, revolution, the Carmation Revolution from then on. You know, my life was changed, and I became a dean of the uh, a school where there were <laughs> 10 professors. <laughs> And most of them were, I mean, my students were a bit younger than me, but I, I was uh, 34 at the time, and I built everything from then on. 74, I built that at, at school, and in 78, we, we launched SASH. So, and, and that's the, I think that was the... the no, that, that, that's yeah. really interesting. It's just my, my small comment. I became head of a program at my university in Mozambique when I was 24, <laughs> and... 80% of my students were 10 years older because we opened university for them because coming out of colonialism, we had to reshape the program. So it was really awkward to enter the room and have everybody much older. And you're like, okay, I, I have to control myself not to run away, not to be scared because it was really intimidating to have all these people there. But I think you both shared this idea that the, those years were formative. But you were involved, engaged in it, and you believed in it. It's not because it was supposed to be like that, the natural order of things it was. But Paul, your formative years, you fight, tell me, you fought against colonialism, and then you were sent to, to, to Russia, to Soviet Union. To Soviet Union, yes. I so, came yeah, back, how I, long I, did you stay there? I, I stayed there for seven years. I came back seven years. seven years. I came back with 24, and when I was 25, I became head of history program. Most of my colleagues, like we opened the program, so most of them went into politics, which I tried for more politics. They became ministers and so on. Um, it was really interesting. How do you decide to come to Rutgers? Because then you got the PhD at Rutgers. Ah, uh, because I, I I studied in the Soviet Union. Uh, we archaeology, right? Uh, no, I, I I was in Strasbourg. I was I I am an history major. I went to Saint Petersburg. It was really interesting. To it was not Lumumba University. No, I was actually, uh, it was a statement. We were sent in very big groups. It was, uh, Mozambique wanted, as several other countries, to create a, 
a new group of students uh, with different perspectives, not to see education as a commodity. Education was to create the new man, so that idea of the new generation uh, to think with the people, from the people, to the people. That was the goal. So we were sent to... A huge group of people was sent to Cuba with Angolans and people from Western Sahara. So it was interesting. We were sent to Soviet Union. I think one of the things that struck me most about the Soviet Union was the idea, the cosmopolitan idea of the world. Because suddenly you are in a room with students from Afghanistan, from Sudan, from Nigeria, from Mongolia, and you, you understand that from Colombia, that I still get in touch from, it, uh, from Panama, that I met here at CERS 30 years later, who were sitting across the room, it's like, hi Sibaldo, how are you? Since we haven't seen each other for 30 years. So it's really something that you get this idea that the world is different, we all come, we, that group, we all share colonialism. It was the thing in common among us. And there was this idea that we could build another program, educational program, to change the world. Uh, I was in Leningrad State University, which was this big rivalry between uh, Leningrad and Moscow, and Moscow was the conservative, um, very controlled, uh, communist-oriented St. Petersburg, but well, you know, was a more like refractory project. But what was interesting there was the idea that there were girls and boys who were off women, off men going and studying. But the idea was that you guys have to take as much as possible from here, but also to learn from our experiments. So in that sense, it was formative, especially the first years about the, when you study the initial years of the Russian Revolution. Then you understand that revolution, it's about experiments. It's about thinking, like you were saying, to that spirit get, get some upon you. But it was a bit like that. that once you start reading really the materials and you had access to archives, how interesting it was, the idea behind the project of the socialist revolution. Did you ever ever had any experience of the secret services of surveillance oh, no. on earth? Yes, all the, time, all the time. All the time. How was that thing here throughout? Oh, God. Uh, no, it was basic because we knew that they were there. First thing they told us that you are not... I could never be with a Russian person on online. There will be always two Russians and me, because they want to demonstrate that they were not passing on uh, information. With me, it was not a big problem. We were in social sciences. We were in an awkward faculty. It was faculty of history. It was history philosophy. It was a lot of people in, out of jail, in jail. So there were lots of those problems. It was the time when there was the invasion of Granada and the Russians went into okay. Afghanistan. So this was possible mm -hmm. in the 80s when I was there. But what struck me the most was the problem with my colleagues, because I had colleagues from Mozambique and from uh, Saint-Tomé, in physics and maths. And there was a big danger because they were doing math, physics and so on. So they were dealing with sensitive subjects and they knew that certain topics they could not get access to that information because it was considered military sensitive so the students could not get that so that was out, outside the reach for us so that's when we understood that science was a political subject that everything had a meaning and it required from us what was the difference between these and Rutgers? oh Rutgers was uh, what's your whole idea with the United States when you were on that? Uh, there were two different things. First, uh, everything looked very much similar on the surface. There was the same structure of architecture, the symponent architecture, like the modernist architecture that was in Coimbra, that was in Italy, that was in uh, the, um, Moscow State University. So suddenly you're like, okay, I've seen it. What, show, what struck me the most, it's bizarre, it was the curtains. Because in US they like the curtains like that. Mm -hmm. they got very, and it was the curtain that I had seen in Soviet Union. So I was like, okay, it can't be happening that I move from one place to another one. 
and the curtains are the same, and the arrogance regarding the third world is the same. And that was something that shook me in the Soviet Union, because I was always Paula, the girl from Mozambique, so there was an adjective. Like, okay, she's not as bright as. And it took us forever to demonstrate that we were as good as. I remember uh, in my first year, I had colleagues from Germany, so the two of, there were four, two girls from Mozambique, and two girls from, Germ from East Germany. And uh, the two of us we were very good in Russian, we spoke fluently. The Germans had no problem than, than us. And we went to the library to request the book, and there were only two copies of the book. And the librarian looked at us and said, Oh, you are from Mozambique. You, don't, you can't understand what the book is about. I'm going to give the box to the Germans. It was a book by Hegel <laughs> on philosophy of history. And I went rocket. I just threw a scan, like, how come you are not giving me the book? What is the difference between the four of us? We are bright. My grades are better, actually, than theirs grade, because one of the girls was really not that, that bright. So it was the first moment, and we understood that the second socialist world was not really accepting us as equals. So it, it somehow trained me to have this chameleon attitude that some in certain places I, I should take most of it but that was not my role. But you didn't experience what I experienced at Yale because I experienced at Yale liberation because I was coming from a dictatorship. I had a, a kind of a, almost democratic but very much uh, under tutelage of the United States in West Berlin because we see so we could see soldiers all over the place, right? And American flags. When I arrived at Yale I saw really a different society because for instance the disputas, the disputes, the, the conflicts in the classroom, we could discuss and so on. Did, did you feel any sense in the United States or more? I had a different, a slightly right. different thing at Yale because... Um, um, because it was much later. It was later and the political work we were doing was getting later. so many groups together and what really got me into the hot seat was um, one year uh, uh, three North Korean um, s scholars were permitted to travel the United States. And so I organized uh, varieties of groups in New Haven to host them just to have find out what else is going on in North Korea. So you know, the South Korean groups were there, but the Mexican groups were there, the Black Panther, everybody was there. And I think that the State Department figured some young guy who could get these people together must be dangerous. So suddenly my phones were ringing at 3 in the morning, there were cars parked out my windows on this heavy surveillance. Shit. And, um, but, and, and, and generally speaking, there was, there was always condescension because, you know, the typical white student at Yale just presumed they belonged there. A lot of these people were from, um, you know, Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge, so forth. And here's the interesting thing, you know, I, I'm sure you may have had this experience. My presumption was, there's a part of us, we never walk in thinking we're the best students there. We just figure if we could survive, mm -hmm. we could do something with it. Absolutely. So, so I, I never, a lot of my colleagues presumed they were just better, you know. I had no idea when I was there that I was actually considered a top student. I found out when my advisor died. But what, but what I, had the, I had the same experience yeah. because you go there and the first, it's the language, it's the it's like they have an answer for everything and I'm like, oh, they are so bright. Like, how and then I laid, laid it there, yes, artists. Yes. But in our kind of idea, because in my case was also the language handicap. Yeah. The beginning, the first year was a little bit yes. complicated. For me too. Because I was much more fluent in the other languages. But, but my advisor, Maurice Natanson, he was a student of Schultz. Okay. So I always, yeah, you know, and, uh, and, and my other advisor was a woman who, Sean Copeland, who was linked yeah, to Africa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she is part of you know, women's theology, black liberation mm -hmm. movements. Yeah. And my third advisor is more conventional, but still unusual. He was John Smith. Mm -hmm. And you know, he studied yeah. with Russell, Bertrand Russell, and Gadamer. That's right. So I had an extraordinary group of people. And but my advisor and I were very close. It was funny when we, um, when, when, when we started working here, it was during the period of the conflicts in Crown Heights in New York. 
And the New York Times loves to say blacks and Jews. They forget that they're black Jews. Mm -hmm. So my advisor's like, you know, I'm Jewish. And I said, well, so am I. <laughs> and it was this, and he grew up in Yiddish theater, it was unusual. But, but it was, but I studied with someone who not only studied phenomenology, but he's a philosophy of psychiatry and sociology. So I never had, you know, yesterday when I spoke, I said I'm not a philosophy nationalist. Mm -hmm. Is because it was always a world yeah, about training, right? Right. But the thing that's striking me from what you were saying and what, what you also said, Paul, is we also have in common always learning through institution builders. Uh, and and, and I, I, I give you an example of what I mean. My, my first sight of this was when I was a, 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 a young adolescent um, wanting to learn as much jazz. And I went to a thing called Jazzmobile. And Jazzmobile is rather interesting. To, to understand Jazzmobile, a group of jazz musicians in the 70s got New York City to give them a high school in Harlem. It was right in, in the area of Harlem that was full of drug dealers and um, uh, prostitution and, you know, street, the street life. You'd walk, there, broken glass and condoms in the street. They wanted that place to be where they would have Jazzmobile. And the, the agreement was just that the tuition for us was $10 a year. Because they only used it to pay the, the, for the electricity and the heat. And what was extraordinary is that the musicians who were doing this were people like Billy Taylor, Charlie Persip, uh, Frank Foster from the Count Basie group. Papa Joe Jones would come in. Dizzy Gillespie would come. You know what I mean? wow. These are our teachers. And we would come, and what was amazing was, that was extraordinary. You have to picture, you're 14 years old when you see this, right? These jazz musicians all taught for free. They would, they would, the classes began at 8 a.m. on a Saturday. And they all showed up in their suits and so forth. The reason was they would play a gig till four in the morning, have breakfast, and come to teach us inner city youth. And it was twice, Saturday and Sunday. And you know what they would do? They would, after they would be with us till four in the afternoon, they would probably take a nap, play all night, and be with us again. So when you see that intergenerational level of commitment mm -hmm. and the creativity to build so much from so little, mm -hmm. and and the thing about jazz musicians is a lot of us don't realize some of the greatest music we listen to. For instance, when we listen to jazz messengers, the musicians who were playing with our Blakey were 17, or with Miles Davis, 17, 18 years old. So the history would say to a young person, there is nothing about your youth that can block you from playing your part and to contribute Absolutely. to history. And so that was one form of institutional creativity, but there were so many other examples. And one of, them, one of the things that struck me was, for instance, um, because uh, other than the United States and Canada, my first time outside of North America, other than in fact I was from Jamaica, was to go to Cuba. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Cuba, you know, the constellation of people there, and there, some of what you mentioned, I. I'm always suspicious whenever I, I see, you probably would say, when you see these people who market, I talked about the commodification mm -hmm. of politics, market themselves as revolutionaries, and they're blabbing all over the place. But if you were really involved in those things, you wouldn't be writing these things in this book. There's so many things that we know we cannot so, write about. Uh, but let's just say what I saw and the people I encountered were so extraordinary. What I learned was knowledge, um, ideas without homes go nowhere. So. One of the things was, um, uh, it was clear to me always to build institutions. So for instance, the Phenomenology Roundtable, Radical Philosophy Review, that was a journal I'd created because I realized that a lot of lefties uh, should have something of quality if they're going to bother to try to get tenure or something. And then, the, you know, the Caribbean Philosophical Association, these were all premised on the idea that you can build institutions through commitment and you didn't have to have a lot of Material capital. But, but, but I, I think, Louis, this is right, but not any kind of institutions. Yeah. I think that innovative institutions, institutions that in a sense are counter-hegemonic institutions mm -hmm. from the very beginning, mm -hmm. or because they are out of place, or because they are direct to how to place people, and not supposed to be the, the real people, the regular people for the institutions. 
And these are the ones from which we benefit most in our lives, I think. Uh, for instance, your project, as you say, it just was for me the project of popular education. It's a kind of popular education, what you are describing. The same type of popular education that at that time, besides at that time, Paulo Freire was doing in Brazil, or Land of Fast Border was doing in Colombia. So there was a time in which people really dedicate part of their lives to grow together, as you usually say, and to interact with others in a free, in a non-mercantile type of relationship. In a free, in, for me, the most crucial one was by this fabulous revolutionary, never called himself revolutionary, Ivan Ilyich, mm -hmm. a priest, a Jesuit priest from Austria, that was a priest in the Bronx. In fact, probably you met him because he, well, he was a Catholic priest a very progressive priest, then was so appalled by the poverty in the United States that he said we should study these aspects because I can't study them here. So he moved to Mexico and in Cuernavaca created a new institution, CIDO, Center, International Center for Documentation, just there. What was the genius of that? On the top of the mountains, Ivan Ilyich, a man of an erudition that I never saw before, after, not, not before, because it was not the German edition. For instance, he, his books in, in, in his library were reference books. We only need reference books. And then we look for the books that we need at any moment, but we need reference books. It's a huge, it's still in Okotepec, it's still there, a huge library. How did he manage to have this? In a very simple way, but also the, these innovative institutions are contradictory. For instance, you would get the money from wealthy North American kids that wanted to learn Spanish. Mm -hmm. So we got somehow the technology, I think it's a military technology called the drill of education that these guys in two weeks would speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And they would be submitted to a torture, you know, very <laughs> unpedagogic type in order to get the money so that you could host all the revolutionaries from, from Latin America that were fleeing from the dictatorships in, in, in Chile, in Argentina, and in Brazil. I met the Allende ministers there uh, after Allende came down, and I met the League of Campomesas, the, the, the peasant leagues from Brazil, the leader, Francisco Julian, exactly there because it was already an exile. And that was the time in which they would bring intellectuals and activists from all over. In fact, it was a pity because he wanted me to be his disciple and, and then the revolution took me over and I came to Portugal and I went back to Cuernavaca. But the, the, the amazing thing is that you can combine a very orthodox thing, which was to sustain the center and then to open up. To, for other people that otherwise could never have the enjoyment of an institution in which they could learn different things and meet different people. I was so privileged as to teaching a, 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 sem a joint seminar with Dregos from, from France on Love and Revolution in 1972. And then we, we were all kinds of other, uh, other, other seminars. So I think the institution building, since we have always discussing one foot in the institutions, one foot outside. The foot outside is absolutely important for the need to create probably new institutions. And that's what we have been up to. In a sense, SES was a kind of a, a counter university within the university, in a sense, as, we, as you formulated it uh, in the 1978. So, can we move on? Or but, will we just stay no, with the, your no, first question? No, I was going to add Tell us now. We never think... respond to the Rutgers issue. No. It was not very important to Rutgers. For you. Rutgers was important to demonstrate that I was good enough in two worlds to tell the truth. The Soviet world the Soviet and, and the capitalist but world. But <laughs> my thing is that I'm in Mozambique and I think I, I, the, I, the three of us, I think, share something. We, had to, we were privileged to have taken a position about how to become something else. You became Jamaican because of independence. You became liberated because you didn't stay. No, but for me it's even more okay. complicated. I thought that I was white, and when I arrived at Yale, I was not white, I was Latino. 
I was the the the, the black the the For the me, dark I white. Still not white. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was know. I was never. You know white. what I because you know what I think so, whiteness is. You know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But but my thing was uh, from my perspective, and I've I've spoke about it with Boa already. First is this arrogance of the self that I think I have it in myself. Is that okay? I've seen the end of two empires. I saw the end of the Portuguese colonial empire. I didn't understand it was happening. It's something very interesting about your your of the emergencies because the emergency there were signs, but only a posteriori do we understand that those things were arriving. And the other day I was re reading my diaries from the Soviet Union, and there are so many things that were pronouncing that something was coming. But only afterwards we understood what was going because I wa while I was there everybody was dying so from Brezhnev until Gorbachev but we understood uh, no until Gorbachev came to power he's still alive but the change was just suddenly accelerated and we understood that things were happening but you can't really grasp what is coming so sometimes people now talk about the change of the American imperial system and I'm like maybe you are seeing a lot of signs but we can't predict what is coming because we can't predict the future we can only theorize about the future when it's past but so that is one of the things I learned but there were two more things that probably shaped my life was that the movement that came to lead the first years towards the independence of Mozambique was very proud of itself, really was a self-awareness uh, revolutionary project of building the Mozambicans because, and I, I always tell the story that this sort of the legitimization of who we are in colonial system is so strong that we never spoke the language, local language, national language, that are not non-national language, became dialect, so we don't speak those dialects, we speak Portuguese, so all schools were in Portuguese and the history was the Portuguese history, so throughout my formative years I, I still remember the rivers from Portugal, the railways from Angola because it was the idea of empire, but nothing very specific about Mozambique, so suddenly independence comes and we start learning about Portu uh, Mozambican literature, Mozambican history, it was a nightmare because no one knew very well what to do, but we had to go that direction. There were no books, so we were just taking notes. That's why my handwriting is dreadful because I, had, when I was in my early high school, I had to take notes of everything. But at the same time, it gave us a responsibility because the Portuguese were leaving. There were no people in two years, 250 people left. 250,000 people left, so we had to replace the teachers. So I was two years ahead and I had to teach back. And it was a challenge, and we said, okay. It, it never occurred to us the violence of the transition. We just said, okay, we have to do. So those were the years of changing the institution, and it changed a lot. Now we went back to capitalism, like this dreadful project. But first was that idea that we were privileged to have been there. And the second, it was this idea that first you think from Mozambique, then you think from Africa, then you think from the world. So there was this nested system to think from your region and to think from there and to arise from there. So what makes us part of Africa? And it was really interesting that from the very early years, that was something Mark, I remember again Braganza, always insisting in that and all the people informed. But what was interesting is that most of my teachers, I was, I finished university, uh, high school at university because there were so few people left that on my last year we were 300 in all the country. In the country at that time had about 15 million people. We were 300 finishing high school. So it's just, sometimes we have to talk about colonial legacy, that was the colonial legacy. We were left with one university uh, full professor, who is the father of Alexandre Quintanilla, and basically no teachers. 
and this getting back to your argument about institutions, we had, there was the need to train people. So these young people like Teresa Cruzicil, Isabel Casimir, Yusuf Adam, they got together and with the help of colleagues that were arriving at that time there was this sort of international solidarity group coming. I'm not talking about corporates, that's another game, bargaining, that's state to support. People that thought that it was important to arrive. So there were lots of people that were political refugees that would arrive uh, from Chile, from Brazil, from Argentina, that brought all these interesting ideas about new educational projects. And together with people from US, UK, uh, Vietnam, uh, Tanzania, Guinea Conakry, they were our teachers and they decided to put together this program for development, development studies, it's in tandem with your mm -hmm. idea about development. And that project was to bring people uh, with middle education, middle high school, up to people like Teresa that were at the middle of university, to, get, to give them training, both theoretical and methodological, for them to finish university, because we needed people highly qualified. Behind that was root first. So these are the interconnections that we never spoke, speak about, because we don't have, well, we sometimes we talk too much about the broader picture, and sometimes we forget but the little things. But, but you see, I think all of that, about the, the common experience among the three of us, is that with our different ages, we are fortunate to live in a time in which it was a kind of a sense of growth and future ahead. Yes. That is to say, we are building something for a better society. I've been reading these days a very disquieting and important book by uh, someone that I admire and I'm, I'm privileged to be a friend of his, Noam Chomsky, Wrecking for the American Dream. It's very interesting. It's his most recent book that, that I course that he's teaching in Texas now. It is dramatic to see how you move from the American dream to American nightmare, so to say, right? Uh, you, myself here, because after all, the interesting thing about the Portuguese, the end of colonialism, is that there is a, a double revolution. There is independence there, and it is dem democracy uh, in Portugal. And that's a difficult part of our decolonization and uh, all the coloniality, if you want. Because the same people that oppress the colonies and kill the people there are the ones that decide to put an end to the fascist regime and bring us democracy. And in fact, you know, there is this, no other country has this experience of a double revolution in one side and the side. So we are, the, the Portuguese is almost the opposite, but the mirror of the Haitian revolution, 1804. In a sense, it's also very awkward in terms of uh, an important revolution of modernity, and we are never recognized as such. And that's why there was this commonality, but we had a sense of future when we were building this institution. We are really, why are we transdisciplinary here at SES? It's because when I was at Yale, well, it was very clear that we were discussing what? Um, which side are you on? Uh, it was one of our books that we read all the time. That is to say, objectivity is not neutrality. Secondly, the, 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 the criticism of, of Talcott Parsons was total in sociology. Mm -hmm. We are moving to something else. So we came from another transdisciplinary type of work. And so there was a sense of the future. I'm saying this because most people that are listening to us, probably our students, they look at this with what is the difference between these guys and us? Is that now they have to reconstruct the growth, in a sense, the idea of the future, uh, in a more, much more counter hegemonic way. It's much more difficult for them because they, they live in a society that is telling them that there's no alternative, that neoliberalism is this, that social networks are this way, and then you can at least, probably at the most, you can have internal growth. You can resist in turn, but you cannot really articulate with others. Don't you think that there's a, a very zeitgeist, I would say? Well, they're living, in, they're living in a period... Well, there's several things. The first one is, um, 
they're living in a very different kind of planet. And the planet that they're, they're living in is a planet of seven billion people and technologies of movement, mm -hmm. not only of physical movement, but of informational movement, that um, have compressed the planet. And that compression has also created a compression of time. And so um, that, that, and, and that, 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 that was a ripe environment for, for um, a certain form of um, um, capital uh, uh, attack on the concept of possibility. So what it, what it does in fact is, and, and it does it through creating a form of political nihilism. See, one of the difficult things about politics proper, you can only do politics with possibility. Mm -hmm. And so, right. And so, what what is happening is has been uh, a reassertion of rule to block politics. I often mention that um, when people have uh, political efficacy, they see their actions as going outward, as affecting the world. When p political possibilities diminished, people turn inward and focus on trying to fix themselves. And what's striking is because this this has been a model of all oppression. If you look, whether, whether it's racism, sexism, I mean, if you look at colonialism, those subjects were obsessed with fixing themselves. What is striking about our moment is all across the world, outside of the mega elite, the people who have historically been located in hierarchies, for instance, say white males as a category, we live in an age where they're trying to fix themselves. And that tells you something. It means that the mechanisms of political possibility are being so eroded that, you see, a lot of people are, are, don't get it. They think they really, there are people digging in trenches to say it really is all about my specific struggle. So it's everything has to be black or everything has to be female, etc. And they're missing the point that, that in order to be politically efficacious, there has to be the, the building and, and strengthening of political institutions. And as those are eroding, we're, we're, we're finding a situation now of a tiny, tiny elite mm -hmm. who, who, has, who have the globe. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that elite is that they can't escape the, this moment of historical consciousness. And what I mean by that, this is a moment in which that's different from the past. If you look at the people of the 18th century, they were constantly obsessed about the 19th century. For the people of the 19th century, they were really thinking about the 20th century. For the people of the 20th century, 21st. What's striking is very, very few people, including intellectuals, who are talking about the 22nd century. It's, I mean, in fact, they can't even think about five years from now. And, and that is one of the, the fundamental crises of our time. Because those of us, of course, who come from a different way of looking at institutions, we know something that, that, um, that the powers that be are trying to make people not think about it. And it's something... But, 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 but let me interject here the, the following. You say, I agree with you, and I start also the idea that there is no alternative. But, but this, for us here, and for the work that you do, and I do, and, I, and, and uh, uh, Paul has been working with us here, uh, that's why we developed the idea of the Ibis Align and the Ibis Models of the South. Uh, is that, in fact, the alternatives are there. You go to Tasmania, you go to this, you report to us, and I do my work, she does her work. We can see people really living otherwise, having different conceptions of the economy, different conceptions of the state, human rights for rivers, for, for mountains, etc. The alternatives are there, but they are discredited, or they are ignored. Because the, the weight of dominant knowledge today is a kind of a dronification of power. It's not just military, it's informational. And I usually say that in a flood, what, is, what we lack most in a flood is potable water. Mm -hmm. But today you are flooded by information, but not potable information very often. And that's precisely that our quest here with our students, and I'm always thinking about them mm -hmm. and the people that may listen to us, is that, please don't go just in one. You need to go in one, in fact. And, and I think we have to go back to the personal. I'm advising the people on, on the left in Brazil 
that they should rely less on, the, on social networks and on TV and go to the periphery, talk to people, their language, their anxieties, their aspirations, because they don't even understand the language they are speaking, their anxieties. But on the other side, don't forget that you can still organize, yeah. that you can really create alternatives, give credibility for us to the rights of the Pachamama, uh, the rights of Mother Earth. Let's join different struggles, but join the struggles. That's, uh, I think, my, my take. No, I, 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 I'm, I agree with you both, but it requires, I think, some form of decolonizing the Germanic way of thinking, because it, it's like the right. thinking present in the dominant institution. So I, that's my next question to you both, is how can we decolonize the academic curriculum at the institutions we are in? That's the great pleasure to be in, in SESH in Coimbra, is that uh, although people are complaining a lot about the need to decolonize, I think we have achieved a lot already at SESH on bringing other scholars and to read other authors here. And that has been quite a challenge because the environment it's around the University of Queen. Sage is not total University of Queen. But how which authors should we discuss more? Because for you both, Cabral and uh, Fanon are crucial authors, not just Hegel, not just the Marx. So how do you guys think about you both think about the need to bridge across different realities to theorize how to make not an author, because you both share the idea that none of this embodied experience represents the whole, so we need to think from the local and to bridge across. So how can we go that direction, to decommodify knowledge, to decolonize knowledge, to depatriarchalize knowledge? How should we move as a moment of hope for towards the 22nd century? You start. No, you well, no, please, go ahead. No. Go ahead. Yes, Go ahead. This is not a trick. It's really, I mean, we are changing completely the logic of the conversation. Because yeah, I don't think that this is a, a, is a conversation among three people. So why don't you start and then we'll follow? No, I was just going to say something that I forgot to say about, you asked me about Rutgers. There is something, it's the first time I'm going to say it, and probably they're never going to allow me back in the US. I grew up with French mirages flowing over our head because our neighbor was apartheid South Africa. And apartheid South Africa would attack each week a country that were part of the frontline state. So they would attack Zambia, later on Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola. So South Africa and its allies were the enemy, explicitly the enemy. And we had lots of colleagues and friends from PAC, ANC, uh, SWAPO, living in Mozambique and being attacked. Some and of killed. Them, some and stuff. some of them Good were stuff. killed. Uh, no, not just, even colleagues, normal, so. colleagues, normal colleagues in school, because they would attack the houses they were living, they would drop bombs there. So that was how you create sometimes the sense of anger, that a good anger that you not stand apartheid and you you stood against apartheid, and U.S. was an ally of apartheid. And I am part of that generation that still remembers a good friend of yours, Manuel Rui, who was the general prosecutor of Angola in the case of the American mercenaries that were condemned to death penalty. So that was always my suspicion. I was always very suspicious of also of US, not just of Russia, but for me US was never a space of freedom. Was in most cases a good space to study, but not a good reference because that impression that we had that US always stood on the side of South Africa and never stood on the side of freedom movements. So it was not for me an ally, objective ally. There were very good people from U.S. supporting Mozambique, but not U.S. as a country, as a government that would be supported. So that probably explains always this sort of distance from U.S. and from the Soviet Union, that the two of them were never really my space because I knew what they wanted from us. The Soviet Union has been much more 
uh, an ally of, of the struggle not, than, than not, the US. Not really. They were, if you read. Or the, the Chinese, at least. The Chinese were more. That's why I keep saying that I'm a very strongly Maoist <laughs> trade. But that is. But to them, just to explain to you how the things work, uh, my father would read. You were talking about the New York Times. My father had a group of. Uh, they were part of. He was a student, yeah. Yeah, but like, yeah, he was a student. But when they they moved, to, they they went to all this stuff of liberation struggles and so on. But they they went back to Mozambique in the late sixties. And my father, together with a group of friends, they had what they called the democratic group. So they were Democrats. They knew that their group, mostly white, would never be attacked by the regime because there were lots of lawyers and so on. So they had all this provocative. But they would get a newspaper called Le Monde, and I was trying very early to read French because we spent some time in French. And the Le Monde would come. I remember I was a child. The Le Monde would come wrapped uh, with a paper band around, and I used to like to have it because it came in different colors to use it as a bracelet. Until one day, my father was called to school to ask why your child is bringing to school a piece of a provocative newspaper that you're not supposed to read. So my father didn't even know that I was doing it, so it was, became forbidden at home. Like, you'd never take this out. But at the same time, it was a place where we would listen to Miss Oluba, because it was, you know, Miss Oluba. It's like Miss Criolla. Uh, we would listen to it, we would listen to Louis Armstrong, uh, to Jess, so it was a sort of protective but provocative environment where some of us grew up in touch with the other side of the line, which was Malangatana, was a good friend of my father, Creverinha, who were political prisoners, they were in jail of the struggle. So it all gives you a sense that the things were wrong, that you have the only way to read was Le Monde and Presence African, because Presence African, Jeanne Afrique, uh, I, I could read French, and sometimes I was 10, 11, and would just go through the newspaper. And all these things about Césaire, uh, the poetry of Césaire was something I grew up with. And we understood that we had to read it. Noemi de Souza. So there was a lot of specific house friend environment, which was not the school environment, obviously, that gave me that idea that we need to read more. And later on, Cabral would come, and Samara Michel, and uh, Fanon, and uh, uh, I remember my father quite often commenting the, the talk he listened to of Malcolm X in Paris, how it impacted on him, because like three days later he was killed in New York. So this sort of environment shapes your mind and makes you aware that we need to learn more from the world, that I think I, I got from uh, reference like that that environment at home later on with Aquino. Aquino Berganza was a very convict Marxist, uh, but a non-orthodox Marxist, saying that we need to negate the negation to get to the truth. So it was always leaving lots of question marks and not and listen to which also drove me towards your work because you are a challenge to us. Like, well, I was a good friend. Of you were a good friend. Yeah. So these, these are the sort of ways of thinking because Fanon was required reading when I was 14, 15. So sometimes we have this thing, okay, it's a for oblige and com you have to read. So it, no, because we would read it together. So it, it, they were interesting formative years. So that's how um, for me, Egal is important, but Fanon, it's, on, it's at the same level. So, well, what I think is it's, it's interesting for our conversation is that three people with some common to check to this. Uh, I was saying probably looking for a war type of time that we live and so on. But they are public intellectuals in different ways from very different trajectories at the same time and living in different contexts. For instance, uh, 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 Lewis is uh, an oppositional figure from the empire, so to say. Mm -hmm. An oppositional figure within the empire. You come 
from the colony and probably will never overcome the idea that you are a colonized, liberated person. I come from a colonizer com uh, country uh, that even though being against the colonialism, we know that these marks are allowed. That our lives are inscribed by these experiences. So what I think is fascinating about the three of us is the capacity of all these different trajectories and in fact different positionings uh, coming from in the world today. We are able to have a conversation in which we can join forces exactly. for the same type of alternatives and struggles. I mean, can we imagine that more people with diverse backgrounds couldn't feel good together? Yeah, one of the things I was, I was leading up to when I was talking about the global situation mm -hmm. uh, is connected to something you just said, Paolo, which is that um, um, if we think about the consciousness of empire, uh, when, when, when countries have a self-consciousness of being an empire, they also develop a, a very specific um, form of bad faith ideology. And what that is, is the belief that the end of that empire is the end of the world. <laughs> and this is the problem, right? The problem is the United States believes that a world without the United States as hegemonic is the end of the world. But then you have to add to it, and this is the thing that people don't understand about the United States, it's not one element. It's not that the United States is simply an empire. The United States emerged when part of empire had a philosophical anthropology of being a racial empire. Mm -hmm. So the American identity has white supremacist positions at its core. So it believes not only that the end of the United States is the end of the world, it believes the end of white supremacy it's is the end of the world. world. And this puts into the American um, political institutions, or rather, not political, governing institutions, mm -hmm a profound problem, because it means it's, connect, it's committed to notions of liberty, but it's adamantly against freedom. And so what you are marking about its alliances, that it's almost always on the wrong side, precisely because those are institutions that are designed to disempower other people. Disempowerment of communities of people is the task of anti-freedom. Because it, that, Louis, yeah. that's a good, that's a fabulous that's point. Yes. You know, because I've been thinking about this. Is is the following? Why is the United States now? This extreme right, this Steve Bannon, Glenn Beck, just said on television uh, last week that if Trump does not manage to be elected in 2020, it will be the end yeah. of the United States. Yeah. So no, precisely. So the truth of the empire comes out better now and more openly now, in the face of the decline. So the white supremacism now, that you can see all over the place, is taking place all over, under the influence of Trump. Yeah. And then we have the Bolsonaro, the, they are imitations. Mm -hmm. The truth of the system comes out better when the system is out of balance. Because when it is more balanced, it can hide some things, it can be more complex. Now this is a struggle for a simplicity, because the simplicity is what will save you from the other. And that's precisely the white supremacism is coming out as the dominant. Now people are saying, but even in Europe, I mean, it, now for the first time, say the United States is not about defending democracy. Yeah. It's about and defending natural resources. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> but, and the, but the other part that connects to the question you, you asked is one, one battle I've had throughout my career, right, is, is, is a battle uh, internal to the left. And what that is, is there are people who um, don't interrogate at a substantive level um, what the meaning of left is. And so although they publicly identify as left, the content level is really to the right. So for instance, in the United States, right, there are many groups who write and publicly avow being revolutionaries, but they could only see reality as legitimate from the standpoint of the dominating forces. Right. You see? And they don't, what they don't realize is that um, if you can work within the consciousness of those 
outside of those forces. In other words, once you are committed to a certain future, uh, the, that other level does not believe you even really exist. And so as you're building the blocks for institutions for the future, because theirs depends on the past, all right wings depend on a, a valorized past, right? Um, I usually put it this way. Um, you can tell the right and the left according to how they respond to a crisis. When there's a crisis, a person who's more conservative will say that the problem is that a decision must be made and the decision has to be what you should return to. And so at first the conservative mm -hmm. element is tradition. Good. However, the problem is they cherry pick the past because what they're looking for is order. And once it becomes about order, they usually say law and order, and tra tradition brings order, it means it becomes a war on difference. So it becomes xenophobic, racist, etc. It becomes uh, too many women are having rights, that kind of stuff. As we know, when that's radicalized, it becomes fascism because it becomes homogeneous, there's no room for anything. The thing, though, is that many on the left think the left is exclusively an opposition to that. They never ask what's the substantive content of a left idea. And the left usually begins by a simple observation. The left begins by looking at the past and realizing that every moment of the past was an imperfect moment in which there's an effort to try to build a better future. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, you can't return to that you have to look at this as just another moment mm -hmm. of dealing with the contradictions for a better future. You, it's, it's not a guaranteed future, but you have to do it. Now, what happens with the left at this point is that the left tends to split. There, there's the romantic left, which unwillingly tries to imagine a romantic past of a left that had the answers, you see? And they don't see that's a conservative project. It has to be the creative understanding of the unique conditions of the present that need to be connected. That's the core of a different future. But Louis, I think but you, you are of, 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 of course touching a, a very key point in my in my work now because I just put oh, the, book, doing the left, I know exactly the left of the world unite. And first, I, I don't know where that the, the, the portrait of the left that you just presented is very much based on the U.S. tradition. Um, I think the, there are too many lefts now in the world, and particularly if you take countries in which even the concept of the left does not exist, but there are the different disputes that really correspond to the, the, the disputes that we now call, for example, in Asia or in India. You can see them. Even in Singapore, you can see these differences, but they are not called left or right. They are called something else. I think that even though it is true uh, that there is still too much sec uh, sectorism, too much dogmatism in the left, and besides this opposition of those that have a kind of a romantic view, but you have to understand that romanticism was used by Stalin to destroy its enemies, of course, and romanticism at the time, I, I think there is a very interesting Marxist in Europe, uh, Michael Lovi or Michel Lovi, is Brazilian origin, but is at CNRS and in France. He's a good friend of mine. He's a great defender of what they call eco, eco Marxism now, right? But uh, and he has a very analysis, a very interesting analysis of Romanticism from a Marxist point of view. But the interesting thing is that when uh, Jose Carlos Mariette, this great Marxist thinker of Peru in the in the thirties, uh, says that in fact the the the, the capital. Uh, scene of Latin America was to be built without the Indian and against the Indian. He wrote that in the in a famous uh, essay, seven essays on the Peruvian reality. Well, the guys from the Comintern and Stalinist uh, period came from Moscow to Lima to reprimand him and say, you are romantic. Because the indigenous people are residue of history, are part of the past, and therefore they are going to be wiped out either assimilated, because the only revolutionary subject is the working class. So, 
In this case, for instance, when I look now, and that's that's why I want just to make more complex your your because I would agree in general with your if you are talking about the white left. The no, problem no. is that there are other lefts now, for instance, what we call now the socialism of the BMVV of Summa Causa is uh, to try to bring in the experiences on the other side of the Ibiza line, the experience of those most excluded by capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchal patri patriarchal uh, uh, domination, to bring out these experiences. In a sense, is the past that was never colonized. Because the colonialism never colonized the whole past. They were always... No, but that's what I was leading to in the argument. The big problem is that there are these conventional ways in which people talk about the right and left that have that 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 have embedded in them the notion of of people who exclusively belong to the past, and so even when they look at the moments of colonization, they presume only the colonizer is connected to the movement of history to the future. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, I've given a series of lectures called at "When Did We Meet." And what the people don't understand is when different groups meet, there's an explosion of temporality. Mm -hmm. There's a new temporality of meeting. And there are some people, however, who think that their moment of meeting is the conclusion of history. Whereas some people, the explosion of time means a new problematic of history, which means they've been devoting their intellectual and normative energy to creating the conditions of that. And so one of the things that's connected to the very point you're making is that these movements and these other groups know that there's life beyond empire, and but, but they also know that there's life when there's a crushing of one's relationship to one's past mm -hmm. and how to connect it to the possibility of a future. And this is where I think the crucial issue comes in because you see, there's this kind of left that looks at issues in the way I, I articulated the, the US concept of liberty versus freedom. And sometimes it's the anarchist left, some you know, the, the, those things. But there's another view where freedom is also linked to a form of, of, of belonging in, in temporal terms as well, through the present to the future and building that. And realizing that building that in the future does not have a blueprint in advance. It requires, in other words, actual political action. And this is why earlier when I talked about disempowerment, I think one of the problems that the right and also certain elements of the left are, are using, it's not, I said certain elements, not entirely, is a form of antipathy to political life. Because political life has contingency, mm -hmm. it, 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 it requires working together, it requires transcending the notion that it's for me, right? For whom political life is, are people also at the same time are paradoxical because they're going to inherit something and you don't know them. And so all of these elements together, it strikes me that we also have to have creative ways of bringing together different ways of talking about how political work will construct. And, and, and Louis, I think you're right. And in, my, in my own experience, uh, political experience in a sense, I think that finally we have probably a, some common ground to unite, articulate different families of the left without uh, dissolving the differences. That is to say, to try to define pragmatic agreements very often, but among the left and not between the left and the right, which has been the dominant, by far the dominant. And I think that precisely because of the neo-fascism uh, rising everywhere, uh, I even wrote a piece called How Democracies Are Dying Democratically, because as we remember very well in 1932, Hitler won two consecutive elections in Germany, and now we can see that with Trump, with Bolsonaro, with Orbán, with Kaczynski, with Salvini, with all the others, anti-democrats that are being elected to the office. I think that at, the, at this moment, the left in many parts of the world, this is, this is happening right now in India. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. just got message from my colleagues from, uh, from the Communist Party there, that all of a sudden, the left is a common ground defending democracy, meaningful democracy. And therefore, we entertain a debate on what is this kind of democracy. So we have used the concept of low-intensity democracy, high-intensity democracy, intercultural democracy. But in any case, is 
this common ground upon which we can come together, because democracy at least allows us to discuss our differences. Uh, if we are not even minimally democracy, by then you cannot discuss our differences. So I think that this is the common ground, and for, for some people, say, well, but, but, but Boa, you are not uh, just really among uh, radical in terms of socialism and things like that. I said, no, I think that our time now, the struggles, we are at a time of defensive struggles. And defensive struggles, and, and I think I get that also from Gramsci, we have to be very careful about the demands. And, and that's why, in a sense, Ralph Nader failed in, in the United States uh, bluntly, even though he was such an excellent person. But that's another thing. Um, I think that we have probably to find ways, because for some of our families in the left, democracy is also white, democracy is also supremacist, democracy is nothing. What is real is autonomy. And now I can see, we had a debate uh, the other day, we had a PhD candidate here, and our candidate anthropologist was reporting to us how the indigenous people now in Brazil that they join under Lula, the Silva, they believed in the state a little bit, even though they continue to be victimized, but they got their land demarcated. Then they, not, they say, no, not anymore. Now we want nothing with the state. We want to be autonomous, back to the jungle. The jungle is not there, so it's dramatic. Because of deforestation, because of mining, and because of But this is, is a desperation of going back. So there are healthy ways of going back and unhealthy ways of going back. And I think that we may, if we manage to breed these intercultural families so that uh, the left in Latin America has always been racist, always. I never saw mm, a racist so intense as the socialists in, in Ecuador. <laughs> you probably were the same experience. No, oh, God, no. Absolutely. But you know, this thing about compression is really crucial because you see, in the, when we live on a bigger planet, it was easier to live in silos. The compression of our planet, even though there are people attempting to rebuild silos, it, they're just too porous. You know, it's absurd right now, all of these efforts to keep people from crossing borders while we have capital freely go everywhere, right? It's basically saying global free, uh, global liberty movement uh, so for, some. For, for those with financial capital and pretty much to, to create the production of vulnerability for everyone else. But the fact is, it's not that simple precisely because that only really works if we fail to, to realize the creativity and determination of those at the bottom. Mm -hmm. No matter how much it's done, They'll go through those, any crack, they'll create new relations, and they're constantly finding creative ways. In fact, they are more on, on the pulse of the future than the people who are trying Absolutely. to suppress them. Absolutely. I, have, said, I have a last question for you too, because we are running short on no, time, and so I cut it. But you have been so interesting, but I think we really need to think about the 22nd century. And it's probably not just going to be in political terms as we have been discussing here. So my provocative question to you both is how can we create transdisciplinary bridges, not just in the academy, like the art or political science, sociology and so on, but through art, through food, through music. What is the role of these other forms of life, of experiencing life, that really makes us be together because when we eat together, we create a community through taste, to sharing, community kitchens and so on. So shouldn't we go outside the formal or this very formalized institutional way of producing knowledge and trying to create? It sounds like a rhetorical question to both yeah, of us because what we are yes. doing. Yeah, just, yes. yeah but I want your statement because <laughs> no. people think that this is peripheral. You know, it's <laughs> not. Just you, make the statement. There's something, there's something I've always been critical of, right? There, because Bo yeah. says it, you say it, but we need to make it stronger. No, okay, he says it, then I'll say it. Yes. Please well, go ahead, Ruby. I'm sorry. Well, there, well, well there, are two, there, there are two things. You know, there are a lot of times where people say, you know, we ought to do something. And then they look at somebody, look for somebody else to do it. Right. And it, it, so the first thing is we have to understand that outcome 
um, can only emerge through performance. It is through the doing we build it. And I usually, I usually try to, to give an example from the past that's a stark example of this. Whenever people are looking for examples of the past, they always look for these heroic figures, you know what I mean? But they never really pay attention to the fact that a lot of the people who were able to build a future, we don't know them. And at the time, their situation was so desperate, they had no reason to know their actions would be of consequence. So for instance, I would bring up, I would try to imagine, I would just raise the question of, of, of a black enslaved person in 1803, whether it's in Brazil or, you know, you name it, right? And, and every bit of evidence around those people, right, whether it's a woman or a man, says the empire is saying to you, it's permanent, you're enslaved, you're, your descendants will be enslaved, there's no future, no possibility, etc. The important question is, why then did they act? And when they acted, they knew that for them immediately, they will never ever see the outcome. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing about political commitment and action, that no matter how much we try to get the predictions, the theories, etc., there's no substitute for the action. And that means then, if we're going to build those bridges, it means we have to go there. We have to learn to listen. We have to learn to be truthful. We also have to have the humility to be students, right? And in the process of learning. In other words, there is no substitute for building. And there are things that exist today, even when we were younger, we couldn't have even imagined. It's because we were in contingent, unexpected circumstances that certain other institutions are here and they're, they're, what they build, we had no way to predict. For instance, even when they're in the beginning, say of this, right, this center, the kind of demographics, the students are here now, there's no way to predict it. No. You, there's no way you could have predicted the, 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 the epistemological creativity of hip hop. No. There's just no way you could have done it. There's no way that we could predict even the concept of hacking. Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many things, but we were the active material conditions mm -hmm. for things that are greater than us. And so the answer is yes, but yes as the action, the commitment of doing. Absolutely. I, I fully agree with, with, with Louis on this. And, and the two points that I want to stress is that sometimes in order to get into these other realities, uh, he is a musician, I work with rappers and, and artists, and I'm a poet, I have 10 books in poetry that nobody uh, probably knows because of my box is sociologist on poet, but I published it, I published now in Spanish and Portuguese, but nobody cares, or the, 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 the canon does not recognize me in Portugal because they put me in the box of the, of the sociologist and not the, the, the box of the, of, the, of the poet. So we do that, but there are, and I, I think I, I do this, I say this, because we are aware of something that is new and probably social sciences before critical or decolonial, decolonial better, but they never recognize this. The first one is that when we say that the left has to defend democracy, we have to say and recognize that most people don't live under democracy in democratic societies. That is to say, our societies are politically democratic and socially fascistic for most people in our world. That's the first. The second one is that we cannot be very anxious about alternatives in our different ways because precisely and saying that now there is no alternative and that is new because now the people have no sense of alternative precisely those guys that really innovated were those guys that at the time people were telling them there is no alternative you are slave you will be slave forever you are a woman and we are condemned to this task no, no other tasks so that's at the point in which the climax of uh, having an alternative sets in, probably the explosion may take place. That's why I'm tragically hopeful that this situation will allow for other ways that could be probably implemented in the, I hope, late in the 21st century and also in 22nd. Well, I thank you both very much, and as we say, Mozambique, the struggle continues. So, yeah, yeah. the struggle continues. The yeah. luta continua, and thank <laughs> you so much. It was thank great. You. It was, thank you. It was a thank fabulous you. talk. Thank you.